Good morning. My name is Mike Harrison. First, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session. I hope that you will find it informative and useful for your operation. A little about myself. I've been involved in the heat treating industry for 16 years. I've worked in both captive and commercial heat treating uh, in various quality operations and general management roles. I've been the engineering manager uh, of the industrial furnace systems division here at Gasberry Thermal Processing Systems for the last two years. I have a bachelor's degree in material science and engineering from the University of Michigan and an MBA from Walsh College. I've previously uh, presented at Furnaces North America and will be presenting again at the upcoming virtual FNA conference. Patrick Weimer will be collecting questions and assisting me for some Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, a few general housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you should all be on mute. Please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions. After my presentation, Patrick will read uh, any questions that have been entered. Uh, we will try to answer all questions. However, if we run out of time and don't have a chance to get to a question, uh, we'll respond personally with an answer after the webinar. Presentation should last about 30 minutes uh, with some time remaining at the end for questions. And finally, this is being recorded and we'll be sending a link to all attendees after the webinar. So thanks again for joining. I'm going to turn off my camera at this time because I'm assuming you did not log in to see my face. So today I'm going to give an introduction, just a brief introduction to uh, nitriding processes, uh, some of the details about the process, how to achieve the process, and some of the equipment used for processing. As far as, as far as an agenda, again, just a brief overview of the nitriding and nitrocarburizing processes, uh, just a brief comparison to a carburizing process, just as a, as a reference. Talk through some of the trade names that you come across with these processes, uh, some of the typical applications, and uh, give a, just a brief equipment overview of some of the more common styles of processes, uh, equipment used for the process. And then finally, just a brief wrap up on some of the things to consider when you're selecting a process. So just what is nitriding and nitrocarburizing? Uh, it's a case hardening process in which nitrogen is diffused into the surface of a steel. Ammonia is used to provide nitrogen for the process, uh, which ultimately dissociates into its individual nitrogen and hydrogen components. Uh, so if you look at the diagram on the left side of the screen, you'll see a, uh, an ammonia molecule, it's NH3, uh, during processing, it cracks apart into its individual nitrogen and hydrogen atoms. Uh, the nitrogen, the blue atoms, will diffuse into the surface of the steel. Uh, some of the nitrogen will recombine with itself to make nitrogen gas, at which point it's inert and then not really useful for the process at that point. And then the hydrogen atoms will recombine with themselves to make uh, hydrogen gas. So in the case of nitrocarburizing, a carburizing gas uh, will also be added uh, for additional carbon diffusion that helps promote compound layer formation. This can be carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, or endothermic gas. Uh, others could be used as well. Um, in, in these processes, generally parts are slow cooled. They can be quenched. Um, in most cases, after nitriding, the, the cooling rate is not critical. So the process ultimately produces the resulting microstructure. Uh, there's a surface layer that consists of an iron nitride compound layer. It's very hard, uh, provides wear resistance and some corrosion protection. This is gener generally referred to as the white layer as it doesn't etch in the same way uh, that the rest of the microstructure does and it appears as uh, white under the microscope when you view it. And the layer below the diffusion zone, uh, the layer of increased nitrogen content, and it provides additional hardness and strength over the core microstructure. So what are some of the results of the process? Uh, you have surface hardness, it's, uh, which in this, these processes are generally uh, material dependent. Uh, alloys that contain strong nitride formers will generally produce higher hardnesses. Um, of, the, of the alloys listed, aluminum and chromium typically provide the most significant benefit. Uh, hardnesses can range somewhere from 45 uh, to 65 rec will see. Some alloys capable of reaching more than 65, again, depending on alloy content. 
Case depths can range from 0.1 up to one millimeter, depending on the process time and, and requirements. The compound zone or white layer, again, it's a high nitrogen content layer, uh, has excellent wear, excellent wear and corrosion properties. Uh, the depths can vary widely depending on the application. Some applications may call for zero white layer, other applications could be up to 30 microns um, or more depending on how much sliding wear uh, is, is desired. And then the core hardness uh, typically should not be affected during these processes. The general rule of thumb would be to run your nitriding process at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit below any prior tempering temperature uh, so you don't impact any of that prior hardening process. So how do we achieve these results? Um, so first off, uh, many processes benefit from a pre-oxidation prior to nitriding. Um, a lot, a light oxide layer can be scrubbed off by the hydrogen that's in the atmosphere. Uh, provides a very fresh surface that will readily accept your nitrogen. Pre-oxidations typically would be in the 575 to 750 Fahrenheit range, and it's going to be performed under an air atmosphere. From a temperature standpoint, these processes generally run in a, in a similar range between nitriding and nitrocarburizing. Uh, nitriding is typically on the lower end, 850 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit is, is typical, uh, with, with nitrocarburizing running slightly hotter in the 1025 to 1100 Fahrenheit range. Cycle times, uh, they tend to vary greatly between processes. Nitriding tends to be a very long process, can be as short as six hours, but up to 72, sometimes 96 hours or more, depending on what case depth is required. Uh, Nitrocarburizing cycles usually are, are on the shorter end, uh, typically one to four hours on average. From an atmosphere standpoint, uh, newer control systems, they have the ability to measure the nitriding potential or the KN. The KN is it's the ratio of the partial pressure of ammonia to the partial pressure of hydrogen that's in the furnace. And ultimately, it gives an indication of the amount of available nitrogen uh, for diffusion into the surface of the steel parts. So nitriding uh, starts with a, a base atmosphere of ammonia. And then there is the, depending on the furnace, uh, there's the ability to add dissociated ammonia, which at that point is already hydrogen and nitrogen. Uh, to help dilute the atmosphere to impact the KN value. Uh, nit Nitrocarburizing will start also as an ammonia base. Uh, some people like to add nitrogen. Again, it's inert, but it helps the carrier gas to help circulate through the furnace. And then to be a carburizing gas addition. Again, this could be um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, endothermic gas, depending on what's available. Parts are typically so slow cooled in a protective atmosphere. Uh, after the nitriding is complete. There are some instances where an oil quench could benefit a nitrocarburized part. Uh, it'll provide a slightly elevated hardness in the diffusion zone. Um, again, these are application specific. Um, and then sometimes uh, a part may require increased corrosion protection. Uh, so some processes offer the option of adding a post nitride oxidation step. This would be a controlled oxidation of the white layer surface uh, where you're creating magnetite, Fe304. And this can be achieved by atmospheric methods, air, nitrous oxide, steam. Um, and there are also some special oxidizing quench oils that could be used, uh, again, to help, to help provide that oxide layer. So this diagram just kind of shows a uh, kind of a typical cycle diagram, uh, what I kind of just talked through. Uh, this is assuming you include a pre and post oxidation as part of the process. Uh, so if you follow the blue line up and around, that's kind of your temperature profile. You heat up to your pre oxidation. The, the bar graphs in the bottom here just kind of show which atmosphere gases could be used or present during that time. Uh, so after your pre oxidation with air, proceed on to your nitriding, nitrocarburizing temperature for whatever time is required. Uh, various mixture of process gases, ammonia, dissociated ammonia, maybe some carbon dioxide if you're running FNC. And then at which point you might cool down to do a post-oxidation. Uh, again, this could be, again, steam, nitrous oxide, um, um, or others, depending on the desired mixture. And at that point, you then cool the furnace back down to ambient temperature uh, to, to remove your load from the furnace. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
in the agenda, I'd like to just do a brief comparison to a carburizing process. And carburizing, is, it's, it's very common, something many people are familiar with. Um, the processes are very different, but again, just to kind of show just how the cycles are, are different. Uh, if we look at a carburizing cycle, 40 thousandths uh, case step, we have our, our critical temperature to transform to austenite above 1300. So in a first step, while the parts are still in the ferrite range, you're gonna heat up above that critical temperature, maybe 1700 Fahrenheit, you're gonna convert the microstructure to austenite. Uh, sometimes a drop step might be included before quenching, take the temperature down a little bit, but ultimately you're going to hold that for maybe six hours at temperature to, to achieve that case step. At which point you're going to quench, you'll form martensite, harden the, the structure um, at that point. And then you have to go back and temper, uh, assuming the parts going to be used at mostly full hardness, you might do a temper at 350 for two hours or so. And your total cycle time start to finish might be 10 hours to achieve that. Uh, and of course, what's not listed here, there'd be a wash step in between to wash quench oil off uh, after quenching before tempering. If you look at a nitriding cycle, again, 40 thousandths case step, uh, critical temperature SDO might be the same, uh, but we're going to heat below that. So you're still going to stay in the ferrite region uh, of, the, of the microstructure. You might hold it at 1,000 degrees, and it's going to take 96 hours in this case to achieve 40 thousandths case step, and at which point it'll cool down. Um, so again, these are, it's not a direct comparison uh, between process results per se, but just to, to give an idea that nitriding is a fairly slow process and does take time to develop that case step. Uh, again, assuming you're trying to achieve a similar case step between processes. So just looking at the two processes, uh, you know, a little more carburizing is, it is a faster process. Nitriding tends to be slower, just the diffusion of nitrogen at those temperatures uh, is a, just a slower mechanism. Uh, deeper case steps are achievable, where nitriding you typically see shallower case steps. Um, carburizing can produce a high core hardness, where in, in nitriding, again, as I mentioned previously, core hardness is not typically impacted, so you've developed that in, a, in prior processing. Uh, but you can generally achieve higher surface hardnesses in nitriding than you can in carburizing. Uh, again, this is alloy dependent, though. Um, if you have the right mixture of, of alloying elements, uh, again, you can achieve some, some very high surface hardness out of nitriding. But a real big key then why you'd run a nitride process over carburizing, even though it's, again, it's quite a bit longer uh, cycle, is, is distortion. Uh, because you don't have the quenching involved, um, you're not running to as high of a temperature. You don't have the, the rapid cooling uh, and phase change that you do in carburizing when you quench. Uh, just produces less distortion out of a nitride process. Not to say there's no distortion. Anytime you put heat to a piece of, of metal, it's it's gonna uh, you're gonna release some prior residual stresses and uh, you know, a chance of creating some distortion. But again, comparing two different parts, uh, you would expect a nitride a nitrided part to have significantly less distortion. To the point where you can usually uh, eliminate some some post heat treat processing. Um, maybe instead of having to go back and and face a gear to uh, to machine it back to size, you can use the gear as is as after nitriding right out of the furnace. Some of the trade names for the processes. Uh, there can be a lot of confusion out there, and you know many many companies um, have develop their own versions of these processes um, and they all they all have their their uh, particular ways that they achieve them but if we look at nitrocarburizing um, FNC is a pretty common name you'll hear for it for ferritic nitrocarburizing uh, ga uh, gas nitrocarburizing is a pretty common term used in Europe uh, again it's just a uh, ferritic nitrocarburizing and gas soft nitriding uh, shows up a lot particularly in, from Asian manufacturers and again, it's just a uh, further nitro carburizing is what they're looking for. And again, there's there's trade names for that. Uh, nitro carburizing with post oxidation. Uh, again, processes like Corridor, Nitro Tech, Nitro Ag, Nitro Flex. Uh, but again, those are all nitro carburizing with an oxidation treatment. And then uh, salt bath FNC. That's a bit out of the scope of this particular presentation. Uh, we're kind of focusing on gas nitro carburizing, but just to be aware that those processes are out there, uh, such as melanite, tenifer processes, um, uh, again, achieved through, through liquid cyanide salts and um, 
again, they have their whole host of names, but all those different processes all fall under the, the nitrocarburizing or nitriding family of processes, uh, just again, minor differences in how they're performed. Some of the typical applications that you might see for a uh, for nitriding, nitrocarburizing, and um, uh, post-oxidation processes. So a, a, a nitriding process typically is high alloyed steels, um, things like 4000 series steels, um, some tool steels, even some stainless steels. Uh, uh, there are some also some some variants uh, that are specifically made for nitriding um, that that um, work very well for the process. They're typically pre-hardened, uh, so they get a quench and temper at some previous step uh, before nitriding. And these are parts that typically require wear resistance and additional strength. Uh, things like gears, shafts, some springs get nitrided, um, among others. Uh, from a nitrocarburizing standpoint, these are typically low alloy steels. Uh, so 1000 series, um, 1100, 1200 series, uh, the 51, 100 series steels are very good candidates for nitrocarburizing. These are parts that typically would require uh, wear resistance, but see low impact. Um, so things that don't have a lot of, maybe a lot of core strength, depending on the alloy. Some gears could be nitrocarburized, stampings, friction plates, um, other distortion prone parts. Uh, a very common one that you might see is parts that were traditionally carbonitrided previously, right? That's a process that is uh, it's in the same family of processes as carburizing. Uh, so higher temperature, there's quenching involved, and thin parts um, can come out like potato chips if you're not careful. Uh, so those are some nice good candidates to switch to a nitrocarburizing process. Um, and then if we look at post -oc, uh, FNC with a post ox, so these are parts that require similar wear resistance as a nitrocarburized part, but they also have additional corrosion protection requirements. Maybe they have to pass a salt spray test or they're used on the underbody of a vehicle, and so they're exposed to the elements, uh, road salt, things like that. Um, so things like ball pivots, uh, ball studs, brake pistons, fluid power components. Um, uh, there's a big market for um, potentially replacing plating processes. So things that have traditionally been chrome plated, I'm talking hard chrome, not, um, not decorative chrome you know, for, for appearance purposes, but parts that require a hard chrome for wear resistance or corrosion protection, um, you could potentially look at a, an FNC with post ox type process uh, to replace that. It's quite a bit more environmentally friendly than a, uh, than a plating process. So now if we start looking at some of the, uh, again, just high level equipment considerations, um, there's, some, there's some basic categories that we need to look at when looking at a style of furnace to, to perform this process. There's safety considerations. Uh, some furnace styles are just inherently more risky than others when running a nitriding process. Uh, in particular, how well does that furnace uh, seal to retain the ammonia atmosphere? Um, if you've worked around ammonia at all, at some point, if you've got a leak on a furnace, you know when ammonia is present and uh, it can be quite irritating uh, to the operators. Um, we need to consider the facility needs, uh, any infrastructure changes, do we need to dig a pit, do we need to add cranes, how is the furnace loaded, uh, is there a forklift that we can use um, or some other method. And then finally, we need to consider the process requirements, such as atmosphere parameters, what level of cleanliness is needed in the final product. Um, and so this list is not completely exhaustive. Uh, it's not meant to imply you can't or shouldn't use a particular type of furnace for, for one nitriding process or another. It's just meant to provide some talking points uh, when you discuss your application uh, with a furnace manufacturer or provider as far as what needs to be considered from the safety facility and process uh, standpoint. So the first one I have is a uh, pit furnace. Uh, it's a very common, common method for nitriding uh, over the years. It's a vertically oriented load. The load is sealed typically in a stainless steel or ink canal retort. Uh, they can be electrically heated or gas fired. Um, and on the, the top lid includes a recirculating fan and that lid can be moved either via pneumatic arm or a crane or other type of lifting device. So some of the advantages of this style of furnace, uh, from a safety standpoint, they have a tight sealing lid, helps keep the atmosphere contained within the retort. 
Uh, these furnaces can include a vacuum pump that allows for fast purging. Uh, it'll ensure that sufficient air is removed prior to introducing ammonia at high temperatures, rather than relying on volume changes of nitrogen. Uh, that could take time. You could have trap points of the, of the nitrogen gas or vacuum pump really help pull that out much more quickly. For the processing side of, uh, side of pit furnace, they're traditionally known for having very excellent temperature uniformity. Uh, the vertical orientation is preferred if you're running long parts, long shafts, uh, usually preferred to hang those uh, so you can minimize distortion. And because of the metallic retort inside, that actually helps accelerate the ammonia uh, dissociation and so you can achieve low can values as part of the process uh, if you need to achieve zero white layer, for example. There are some drawbacks. Uh, the style of furnace needs to be loaded by a crane. Uh, so you need to have a, a safe, reliable crane operator, and that, that person, that worker, can be hard to, to come by. Uh, there are significant infrastructure changes that may be needed. Uh, many times these furnaces are set down into the floor, uh, so the lid is, is close to a, a good working height for, a, for an operator. Uh, but you need to break up the floor, build a pit, you need to build platforms around the furnace. Um, you also need to be careful when working on this style of furnace. Uh, if you send a maintenance maintenance uh, uh, personnel down into the into the pit or into the retort into the furnace itself uh, to perform work, there's there's obviously a number of safety precautions have to be uh, to be made to make sure it's safe to send a person down in there uh, from a confined state confined space standpoint. This is a it's a single chamber furnace, uh, so cooling can be slow. <clears throat> Although there are some arrangements that, <clears throat> excuse me, allow a, a sealed retort to be pulled out uh, of the entire heating vessel, and so you can create faster cooling rates, and you can allow for a second retort to start processing the next load. Uh, but again, floor space is needed for that, and you're moving a um, a very heavy, at that point, very hot uh, uh, furnace retort. Um, so again, there's a lot of considerations that need to be made when doing that. Um, as with all nitriding processes, part cleanliness is important. Uh, but if using a vacuum pump, um, it becomes even more critical as there's just there's simply no oxygen there in the furnace that can help burn off any residual oils during heat up. Um, and then the fast ammonia dissociation rates because of the metallic retort um, could be detrimental if you're trying to achieve a high can, uh, uh, could, could be working against you. Um, or you need to consider using materials like Inconel for the retort material. Next up is the Integral Quench Batch Furnace. It's a very popular choice, uh, particularly within the commercial heat treating world. It's a very flexible furnace. They can run carburizing, carbonitriding, neutral hardening. Um, in addition to nitriding processes, typically you see more nitrocarburizing uh, than nitriding in a um, in a batch IQ furnace, uh, but it is it is possible. The multi-chamber furnace, you have the rear hot zone uh, where the load is, is processed, and then the load moves back into the vestibule uh, onto the elevator, and then usually you have, um, at a minimum, you have a quench oil tank. Uh, the load can go down in to be, to be cooled, or many furnaces now will include a top cool chamber, um, so you can move to there for a, a slow cooling. And then in the meantime, while the load, whether in the quench or the top cool, can move, a, a second load can move through the vestibule into the hot zone for to start processing, uh, so you can get lots of loads uh, back to back. So some of the advantages, as I mentioned, it's a very flexible furnace. You can run a lot of different processes uh, with this type of furnace. Typically, it's part of an automated system. Uh, I mean, at, at a minimum, the furnace, uh, especially newer furnaces, are automated as far as the movement within the furnace itself between hot zone and vestibule and and to the various cooling stations. Um, but then beyond that, the furnace itself can be integrated into a line with a, uh, a charge car set on rails that can move loads automatically from, from one process to the next. Um, it offers multiple cooling options. Again, you have the oil quench or the top cool with a protective atmosphere. Um, as, I, as I mentioned previously, it's not as common, but there are some FNC processes that uh, benefit from a faster cooling rate. Uh, for some additional strength in that diffusion zone. And so this is one of the few furnaces that can offer that option if that's required. It does allow for multiple processing, uh, multiple load processing. Part cleanliness is a little less critical 
Um, in this atmosphere, usually the the atmosphere, because you're using endothermic gas, there is a little bit of oxygen there that's present and um, uh, more forgiving when it with the ability to burn off anything that may still be on the parts. And these furnaces are typically brick and fiber lined, uh, which provides slower ammonia dissociation rates, meaning that high cane values are possible uh, uh, if necessary for that particular process. So the drawbacks though, um, uh, there's a number of them when it comes to safety. These are very complicated furnaces, a lot of moving parts, they require a lot of maintenance attention. Uh, they do require a significant amount of operator training. Even furnaces that are completely automated still need an operator uh, just at a minimum to understand the sequence of operation. So you're not trying to load a second load into the furnace when available positions aren't, aren't there. Uh, many IQ furnaces use endothermic gas as the carburizing source for FNC. And because of this, for safety reasons, you have to run the furnace up to 1400 degrees. There's usually a, a safety limit within the furnace that has to be met before you can introduce endothermic gas. Uh, so you have to heat up the furnace first, introduce your endothermic gas, and then cool the furnace down while the endo is still flowing. Um, at that point, the furnace is still safe uh, to operate and to run, but you know, it's, it's, you do have to kind of, uh, for a process that's not meant to run that hot, you have to, you have to run that furnace up hotter first and then allow time to, to let it cool back down um, in order to introduce the gases. Uh, there's, between the doors, there's an inner and outer door on the system and the top cool chamber, there's just lots of leak points. Um, between the inner and outer doors, lifting cylinder seals, elevator seals. Uh, so if you're not careful, you get a lot of discolored parts. Um, or you're leaking ammonia into the into the facility. They do require some infrastructure changes. Typically, uh, if the furnace includes a quench tank, um, that's usually set into the floor. They can be designed to just sit on the floor without a pit, but then the furnace itself sits very high. And because of the refractory lining, um, it can just it can be slow to change over the atmosphere. So if you have different recipe mixtures between processes, uh, you need to allow the furnace time. To, uh, to, um, to push one atmosphere mixture out and make sure you're fully set on the new mixture. Um, again, because you're just running loads back to back. So that, that can be, uh, that can slow down the process uh, in between loads. And then the last style of furnace uh, I'm gonna discuss at the moment is the horizontal vacuum style uh, uh, Furnace, it's a uh, similar to a pit furnace. Uh, if you think of a pit furnace, it's kind of laying on its side, uh, typically utilizes a steel or canal retort. Uh, the load sits on horizontal load supports, uh, like a batch style furnace. There's a recircling fan on the back wall of the retort and um, an inner lining, inner baffle to help aid in atmosphere circulation. Uh, this style of furnace would include a vacuum pump um, and a, a tight sealing door. And these furnaces can be electrically heated or they can be gas fired as well. So from a safety standpoint, uh, these furnaces again have a, a very tight sealing door, it helps keep the atmosphere contained within the retort. Uh, the vacuum pump allows for fast purging, uh, again, to ensure that sufficient air is removed prior to introducing ammonia at high temperatures, uh, again, rather than relying on the volume changes of nitrogen. Uh, there really shouldn't be any major infrastructure changes needed. The furnace can, um, they can just sit right on the plant floor and just be bolted down. Uh, so there's no piss to worry about. There's, um, there's less of a maintenance concern sending someone inside because uh, again, there's no pit to go down into. They're easy to load. You can use a forklift or a walk behind uh, furnace loader, electric walk, uh, electric walk behind like you'd load a vacuum furnace. They have excellent temperature uniformity. Um, usually you have a pretty good part appearance, uh, again, just by removing that oxygen during the processing, uh, you, you have less source of discoloration uh, through the process. So you can make some very, very nice looking parts. And similar to a pit furnace, right, metallic retort, uh, you can accelerate the ammonia dissociation. So if you have processes that require very low KMs, uh, that, can, that can very easily be achieved in this style of furnace. Some of the drawbacks, again, it's, it, this is also a single chamber furnace, so it can be slow to cool. Uh, just due to the nature of the configuration of the, the way the retort is installed, um, it's, it's, it's not convenient on this style of furnace to pull the entire retort while still sealed like you could on a pit furnace. Uh, so you have to let the, the load cool, though you can add some additional um, 
uh, cooling systems to help cool the furnace down a little bit a little bit more quickly. Part cleanliness is incredibly important uh, in this style of furnace. Again, with the vacuum pump and the process gases used, uh, there's just it's not forgiving uh, in the sense of trying to burn off any residual oils. So you have to make sure you have a very nice, uh, well-maintained cleaning process prior to nitriding. And that high dissociation rate uh, that allows a low KN kind of works against you. And uh, if you have a high KN process, could be difficult. Again, that could be overcome with different retort materials, uh, in particular in canal, uh, uh, doing very well at providing high KNs if that's what's required for a, for a process. So just to wrap up, just from a high level, some of the process considerations uh, we've kind of touched on here. We've talked just a very little bit about part cleanliness, uh, but that is important in the in the process, the particular process that's being run, um, as well as the method, so the furnace being used. Um, uh, part cleanliness plays into that. Pretreatments, things like um, any prior uh, uh, hardening that has to be done, quench and temper treatments. Um, or things like a pre-oxidation might be important. Alloy content is important in achieving the end results of the process, in particular the surface hardness. And there's a, there's a big difference between low alloy steels and stainless steels and, and how they interact with the atmosphere. Distortion and fixturing, those go together. How, how's the, how are the parts gonna be loaded into the furnace? Um, and can you use a, again, a nitriding or FNC process that is just more more forgiving when it comes to distortion um, and creating less distortion um, is something to consider. Cooling methods, again, most cases it's uh, a slow cool is, is sufficient, but is an oil quench necessary on a particular application? Um, and then what kind of part appearance of surface finish? These go hand in hand with if vacuum pumps are needed, um, or is it okay if there's some slight discoloration? You know, those are purely cosmetic things, no metallurg metallurgical impact, but um, again, important things to consider uh, when selecting and designing your process. So that is that is what I have for the moment. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Uh, see if uh, see if I can answer any questions that may have come in. Hey, Mike. This is Patrick. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, first one is: Is there a reason you would not want to have white layer on the surface of the parts at, at the end of the cycle? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is, it, it's very application uh, specific as far as how that part is used. Um, yeah, as I, as I kind of touched on, the white layer is very hard. It's also very brittle. Uh, it's an iron nitride. It's bordering on, um, it's also borderline ceramic uh, by, by the time you're done processing. And so in applications, if there's, if you have something that has a lot of high impact loading, um, that white layer could actually chip and flake away. And so now you have this, this very hard, um, uh, this very hard object now floating around, say in a transmission or a gearbox or whatever, and it's just going to kind of grind away at the rest of the gears or the rest of the components in there. Uh, so some applications, you, you, you don't want white layer then, you still have the diffusion zone, you still have higher hardness. Uh, it's not as high then as what you would with, with a white layer, but um, you know, so you still get that benefit and that strength and the wear resistance, uh, maybe that is sufficient for that application, but um, you just don't have that risk of these foreign now these foreign materials that are floating around and causing causing havoc to uh, to the rest of the components. And that leads us to the second question, which is somewhat related: um, the difference between using high KN and low KN during the price process. Uh, so the KN value, um, assuming everything else in the cycle is equal, so you know similar time, similar temperature. Uh, just different KN values. Um, the the KN is it's just it's a more modern way of discussing the dissociation uh, amount of the ammonia. So the uh, as I mentioned previously, the the KN value uh, kind of tells you how much nitrogen is available for nitriding. So if you have a high KN, um, will then typically translate to a thicker, deeper white layer, where a lower KN. Uh, would then translate to a shallower KN. So it's, it's just a way, you know, if you have to run a particular cycle to achieve a case depth deeper than the white layer um, of some depth, now over that given time, how do you manage the white layer depth? Um, and you can do that with the KN value. Um, 
and again, so high, higher KN values will achieve a, a thicker white layer depth, and yeah, the the lower KN values will achieve a, a shallower white layer depth. Again, all other things being equal. And those were the only two questions I had at this point. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we take great pride in supporting the best, best industry in the world, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have on this or any other uh, heat treating questions that we can help with. Uh, my contact info is up on the screen. I can be reached via email at mharrison at gasberry.com. Um, and of course, you can visit our website, www.gasberry.com, for a comprehensive look at all of our great products. Uh, so thanks again for your time, and everybody take care.